This is Dr. Ted Hildebrandt in his Old Testament History, Literature, and Theology course, lecture number 21, finishing up the book of Judges with Samson and the tale of the two Levites, and then the book of Ruth. All right, let's talk about the book of Judges then, all right? And uh, we, want, we were talking last time about Gideon fighting Midian, and Gideon defeating the Midianites with the sword of the Lord, and Gideon throwing down their Maltoff cocktail uh, lamps and catching things on fire and blowing the trumpets and winning the victory against the Midianites. Then what happened after Gideon's big victory is that Gideon has a son, and the son's name is Abimelech. Now that name is really important. Abimelech, his name means Avimelech. And if I got his name here, yeah. His name here is Abimelech. Abimelech, Abba means what in Hebrew kinds of things? Abba, father. So Avi means my father. Melech means king. Melech means king. My father is king. Who is his father? His father was Gideon. Was his father king? No, he wasn't. There, are there any kings in Israel in the time of Judges? No. So is this name really kind of an interesting name, kind of clashing with the book? My father is king, but he wasn't king. But his name is Abimelech, nevertheless. Now what happens is Abimelech takes over. He's kind of like the older brother. And he, what he does to all his other siblings is he kills them all off. And there's like, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 of them. There's a ton of them. He kills off his brothers and sisters, brothers. And what happens is Jotham, one of the youngest guys, gets away. And Jotham then goes up on a hillside and he's going to tell a fable to his brother. And this is basically in chapter 9 of the book of Judges. And he's going to tell this fable. I'll just narrate and give a kind of a summary, crass summary of the parable. But he basically, he goes up and he tells the story. He says, hey, the trees of the forest went out to make themselves a king. By the way, what is a fable? Are there fables in the Bible? Are there fables in the Bible? What's a fable? Usually a fable is like an animal talking or a tree talking. Well, here, the, the trees of the forest go out to anoint themselves a king. And so they go to the olive tree and they say to the olive tree, olive tree, would you be our king? You give us olive oil and all these wonderful things that we eat, olives and things that we put on pizza, and we just love to have an olive tree for our king. And the olive tree says, I can't be your king. If I be your king, there's no olives and things. You guys, this is no, no good. So they go to the vine and they say to the vine, hey, vine, you be our king, man. You can party all the time now. The vine is our king, the wine for everybody. And the vine says, I can't be your king because if I be your king, I can't produce the grapes to grow and make everybody the heart of man happy. So finally, they go to the bramble bush now the bramble bush, you guys ever been in Texas? A bramble bush is a bush that there's no leaves on. All it is is thorns and thistles. And it's, it slices your legs up when you try to walk through them. They're usually about this high. They're low bushes and stuff like that, really thorny, very almost no leaves on them. They're just these, these thorns and thistles. And so what happens is they come to the, the thorn bush and they said, thorn bush, would you be our king? And the thorn bush says, I will be your king. Come hide in my shadow. Now, why is this so ironic? Because the thorn bush doesn't have a shadow. The thorn bush is good for what? It's good for nothing. And yet it claims it's going to be the king. What is Jotham trying to say about Abimelech through this story? Is Abimelech the least likely to be the king? And yet he's pretending like he's the big king, but he's the least likely. The olive tree is gone, the vine is gone, and here is this, here is this bramble bush now trying to, this thorn bush trying to take become king. And so this is, this is a fable. This is a fable that Jotham tells. It's a fable that's recorded in the Bible. So if you want to get people mad, you say, well, there are fables in the Bible and things. And people get all bent out of shape because a lot of people think the Bible is a fable and stuff rather than history. But there are fables in the Bible. And this one told by Jotham about the trees making this king is a fable. By the way, is it a sarcastic fable meant to put down his older brother? And so that's what uh, this uh, fable is there. The thorn bush on ruling, power's ability. Um, I think we've said this before. There's money, sex, and power. Did we talk about this last time? And power, power is the one that gets Abimelech, okay? 
And he kills, he kills his own brothers. He kills his own brothers so that he can have power and be the next ruler and things. And oftentimes you see that kind of thing. Uh, so sad, sad story. This is the end of Gideon. Do you see how Gideon was really a good person? But you see after Gideon leaves, his sons, they go into this uh, warfare in their family and just destroys his family. So Gideon's clan goes down. Now, the first kingship attempt, Abimelech, and so some people associate this with the first kingship attempt, a failed attempt at kingship uh, here in the book of Judges. In the book of Judges, there is what? There is no king in Israel, and everyone does that which is right in their own eyes, right? And so Abimelech here is the first attempt at that kind of petty kingship kind of possibly thing going on in the book of Judges. A failed attempt, however. Now, Jephthah. What about this fellow Jephthah? He's famous for basically one thing. He's a Gileadite. Uh, he didn't really fit into society real well. Um, and so basically he was driven out because he was not accepted. His mother, uh, some illegitimacy there or whatever. And uh, what happens? Um, does God ever say the exact opposite of what he means? In chapter 10, verse 14, God says this. But you have forsaken me. He's talking to the people of Israel. He says, you have forsaken me and served other gods, so I will no longer save you. God's role as the rescuer. I will no longer save you. And then God says this, go and cry out to the gods you have chosen. Go cry out to the gods you have chosen. Let them save you when you are in trouble. Is God commanding his people to, to idolatry here? He says, go to the gods you've made and, and cry out to them. Is God commanding idolatry here? Is this sarcasm? Is God being sarcastic? He says, hey, I'm no longer going to save you because you guys are worshiping these idols. Okay, go to the idols. Let them save you. That's sarcastic. He's wanting them to tell them to get rid of the idols and come back to him. But he uses sarcasm here, saying the exact opposite of what he meant. And again, is there sarcasm in the Bible? Actually, does God get sarcastic? Yes, he does. Okay, so you've got to be real careful. I'm not using that as an excuse. A lot of times I use sarcasm. Can sarcasm be very detrimental? And I, I'll never forget my daughter. I used sarcasm when she was in sixth grade, and she came back to me like 10, 15 years later, and she said, I remember when you said, and quoted some crazy thing that I had said, but I was being sarcastic. She didn't get the fact that it was sarcastic, and she thought that's what I actually held. So what I'm saying is be careful with sarcasm. Can sarcasm do damage on people who don't understand? But God uses it here. So there's a place for sarcasm. There's a place not for sarcasm. Sounds like Ecclesiastes or something. <laughs> Anyways, okay, time to be sarcastic and not. So context, context determines meaning. And it's clear here, God didn't mean for them to be idolaters. He's, by the way, this is the point. God is using sarcasm to do what? What is the function of the sarcasm? Does the sarcasm function to rebuke them? So he's using sarcasm to rebuke them, okay? And so you've got to pick that up from the context then and things. Now, what happens? Jephthah goes out and says, okay, I'll fight for you guys. Uh, I, will be, I will lead you. I'll be the judge and things like that. God makes him a judge and things. And then he says this, um, the spirit of the Lord came on Jephthah. This is chapter 11, verse 29. He crossed over Gilead and things. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord. And this is the vow. This is what Jephthah is most famous for, his vow. He says to God, Jephthah made a vow to the Lord. If you give the Ammonites into my hands, whatever comes out the door of my house to meet me when I return in triumph from the Ammonites will be the Lord's and I will sacrifice it as a burnt offering. He goes out to battle against the Ammonites. The Ammonites are over here in Jordan. And what happens? He comes home. Who comes out to meet him when he comes home? His daughter. Okay, his daughter comes out to meet him when he comes home. And so now this raises a question about vows. Um, do you have to be careful about taking vows before God? Ecclesiastes has some interesting things on this. Let me just read this. Um, it was um, Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Um, Ecclesiastes, there's great wisdom in the book of Ecclesiastes, by the way. Um, and it says this. When you make a vow to God, 
Oh, actually, let me start back up of verse 1. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Go near to listen rather than to sacrifice, offer the sacrifice of fools who do not know that they do wrong. Do not be quick with your mouth. mouth. Do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. God is in heaven and you are on earth, so let your words be few. Then down to verse 4. When you make a vow to God, do not delay in fulfilling it. He has no pleasure in fools. Fulfill your vow. It is better not to make a vow than to make a vow and not to fulfill it. It is better not to make a vow than to make a vow and not fulfill it. And what does he say? When you go into the house of the God, let your words be few. I worry sometimes about some of these youth rallies they have when I was younger. They had, and then people get up there and say, oh, you know, do you commit yourself to reading you know, three chapters of Scripture every day? How many of you will do that? Let everybody stand up. And so all the people stand up and they make a vow to read, things like that. And what I'm saying is be very careful about doing that, okay? God does not delight in fools. And just be careful about making vows before God. Be careful about it. Je- Jephthah makes this vow. Whatever comes out the door of my house. Now the question comes up then. Does Jephthah burn his daughter up? Does Jephthah burn his daughter up? Does he burn her as a sacrifice? Uh, let me just say this. Um, probably 80 to 90% of Old Testament scholars say Jephthah burned his daughter up. Probably 80 to 90% of scholars say Jephthah burned his, burned his daughter up. Okay, 80 to 90% of Old Testament scholars. Now what should that do? I'm going to tell you that I don't think he burned her, but what should that put in the back of your mind? Hillebrand's the professor of this class. He's got it right. <laughs> no, no. Okay, Hillebrand is most possibly wrong on this, but does he still think it's right? Okay, what I'm saying is I, I know that most of my friends who are Old Testament scholars would disagree with me on this point, but let me tell you why I think that Jephthah did not burn his daughter up, okay? I, I think he didn't, okay? But uh, it's a minority position. So what I'm trying to say is... Uh, do I have to admit that I can be wrong sometimes? Yeah, and I, I may be, well be wrong here. And I just want to warn you that this is a minority position, so he may have burned her up. But here's the reasons why I think he didn't, okay? So let me, um, um, first of all, uh, when she is told, when Jephthah returned to his house in Mitzpah, who should come out to meet him but his daughter, dancing to the sound of tambourines. Her father's come home from the war. It's like a military guy coming back from Afghanistan. His kids run out and just see daddy's home. And she... And then it says, she was his only child. Why does it bring that up, that she was his only child? Just notice that. She was his only child. Except for her, he had neither son nor daughter. So it makes it really, really explicit. My father, she replied, you have given your word to the Lord. Do to me just as you promised, now that the Lord has avenged you on your enemy. So she says, okay, I'm in with this too, father. She says, give me two months. She has one request from her dad. She says, give me two months to roam the hills and weep with my friends. Why? Because I'm going to be burned up? No. She says, let me go two months to roam the hills to weep with my friends because I will never marry. Now, if you were getting burned up and on a sacrifice on an altar, would you be worried the fact that you never married? Or would marriage kind of take a little... I mean, if you're going to be burned with fire, is that a little bit more important than being married? Okay, so, but notice here she says, go that I may never marry. You may go. And she went two months in the hills. She and the girls went out in the hills and wept because she would never marry. And after two months, she returned to her father, and he did to her as he had vowed. And then what's the next line? And she was a virgin... And you say, wait a minute, he just burned her up. Who gives a rip at that point whether she's a virgin or not? This guy just smoked his daughter up with a sacrificial fire. Okay, why would it mention, and she was a virgin? Do virgins burn hotter or what's the deal? I mean, you know what I'm saying. I mean, just, I'm sorry, but just, you know, why, why, in other words, if he just burned her up, why would you mention right after he burned her up that she's a virgin? If something else happened, however, Is it possible that what he says, that he would offer up whatever came out the door of his house, two things, two ways of taking this. Is it possible to read it like this? The Hebrew word for and can also be translated or. The Hebrew word for and can also be translated or. Is there a difference between and and or? What if you take it this way? 
If you give me the Ammonites into my hands, whatever comes out the door of my house to meet me when I return in triumph from the Ammonites will be the Lord's, or I will offer it as a sacrifice. Now, the NIV says, will be the Lord's, and I will offer it as a sacrifice. Is that different than saying, I will dedicate it to the Lord, or I will offer it as a sacrifice? And that allows him then to dedicate his daughter to the Lord. By the way, is it important then that she's a virgin, that she never married, that she's dedicated to the Lord? What does that mean? Will she have any children? She will never have any children. That means that Jephthah will have what? Descendants. She is his only daughter. Is it show, by the way, in the ancient world, was it a big thing to have no descendant? Did your line end at that point? And that's why then she's weeping, he's weeping, because his line is over. She is his last shot at having descendants, and now it's cut off. She's dedicated to the Lord. She will never marry. She's a virgin. She will have no children. Does that make sense a little bit? Okay, so I think that's what happened. She, he dedicated her to the Lord. By the way, if you go over to Numbers chapter 8, and Dr. Gordon Hugenberger at Park Street Church uh, pointed this out. I think it was a brilliant uh, observation. I missed it, actually, uh, in the past. That's why I love going to his church. I, every time I go to his church, I learn something new. And uh, he pulled this thing out of Numbers chapter 8, verse 11. Check this out. Uh, Numbers 8, verse 11, it says, Aaron is to present the Levites before the Lord as a wave offering. The Levites are to be presented as a wave offering. Does that mean that he kills all the Levites and waves them before the Lord as a sacrifice? No, it means he dedicates them to the Lord as a sacrifice. Does anybody remember Romans chapter 12, verse 1? As a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service that we are to dedicate ourselves as a sacrifice to God as well, so that it's more of a dedicatory thing when it refers to human beings. So I think between these things then, so I want to suggest then, but by the way, do I have to kind of back off myself to say what? Most Old Testament scholars disagree with me. Is it likely that I'm wrong here? The honest truth is I may be, the NIV is translated with an and instead of an or. So you know what I'm saying? At certain points you've got to be humble. You, you, can you still be stubborn though? And say, I think, I think, I think he didn't burn. It. I think he dedicated it to the Lord, and I think the context kind of indicates that. But it very well could be wrong here. So, okay, that's just that's Jephthah. Now, Shibboleth and Sibboleth. This is an SAT question, a vocabulary question on the SAT. Shibboleth. What does Shibboleth mean? Shibboleth is like an in word that gets you into a group, right? Are there certain groups that have certain words that they use that get you into their group? Like if I said, I'm part of the 99, that would get me into, I'm part of the 99%, that would get me into what group? Occupy Wall Street, yeah, I'm part of the 99%. Okay, I'm, <laughs> on these salaries, you can be guaranteed we're not part of the 1%, uh, but I'm not part of the 99, but that's a big you know, thing for them, uh, the 99, okay, percent. So, so each, various groups have certain buzzwords that they use, each group, and, and have you seen this in high school? Do they still do it in high school? So different groups have different buzzwords that they use. Um, athletic guys talk a certain way. Um, people that are doing drugs in my day talked a different way um, and so different people talk with different jive talk and stuff and so what happens is here's what happens with Jephthah. Jephthah's fighting over here in Jordan and the Ephraimites who are over here they didn't come over to help Jephthah and so they come over to Jephthah and they want to make war with Jephthah saying you didn't invite us to war and things like that we're gonna come over and now raise Cain with you so Jephthah gets, sets up at the Jordan River and as the Ephraimites cross the Jordan River he gets them to say Shibboleth but he knows that because they're from Ephraim, they can't say Shibboleth because they always say Ka and they say Idir. And so he knows that he can, because they say Idir and Ka, that he knows they're from Boston. And he knows there's regional dialects. If I said, y'all come down to my place, or you know, you would say y'all, as soon as I say y'all, what happens? In New England, when you say y'all, your IQ goes down 20 points. Okay, now that's how it is in, no, no, seriously, that's how it is in New England. On the other hand, if you talk with a British accent in New England, what happens? Your IQ goes up 20 points, okay? So I'm just joking, but not really. So anyways, okay. So what, 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 what I'm saying is, when they cross here, he says, say Shibboleth, and they say Sibboleth. 
And he says, those guys are Ephraimites. And then he knew that they were trying to, you know, they were lying. He knew by the way they pronounced it that they were lying. And then he killed the Ephraimites, okay? So this shibboleth, shibboleth is used then. And in general, it's an English word now. It's a Hebrew word, but it's come over into English to mean a buzzword within a certain group that means you're identified with that group. Okay, so and every group has these buzzwords. By the way, do we as Christians talk in a certain language that's different? You know what I'm saying? We have our certain buzzwords as well. Every, every group will have their buzzwords kind of thing. So shibboleth, those buzzwords, those, those group identifying words are called shibboleths. Shibboleths. So, okay, now, Shimshon. Shimshon, you guys call him. How many of you pronounce this guy's name Samson with a P in it? Samson, okay? We pronounce it with a P. Do you realize, is there any P in there? No. Actually, what you're doing is you're using the Greek pronunciation of this. The Greek has a P in it, and it's come over into English, even though his name is, Sh uh, by the way, you see that S-M-S, Shamash means son. So actually, his name really means sonny. So Samson, if you were to translate his name, I'm just joking around, but not really. I call Samson Sonny. Okay, that's what his name is, Sonny. Okay, Samson, Simshon. Now, what do we know about Samson? First of all, let me just do some territorial things here with Samson. Where are the Philistines? Okay, let's do a classroom thing first of all. Sea of Galilee, Jordan River, Dead Sea. You guys are Jordan, you guys are Israel, you guys are the Mediterranean Sea. Where in Israel are the Philistines going to be? Right on the Mediterranean coast. There's a low coastline there. They're going to be on the coast. So that means the Philistines, the Mediterranean coast is out here. The Philistines are going to be in, in here. And what happens is then, the Philistines are always going to try to attack the Jews. Where? Where are the Jews? Jerusalem, in Israel. So the Jews are up in the mountains. So the Philistines will always come up into the mountains. But there's only certain ways you can get into the mountains. And so one of those ways into the mountains is up through the Beit Horon, upper and lower Beit Horon. You come up this direction, and you come up this road. By the way, these roads are still there to this day. Till this day, when you want to go up into the mountains, you follow these same roads that have been there for 2,000 years, 3,000 years. So anyways, this is the Beit Horon entrance. There's another entrance here. This is the Kiryat Yarim. When I say Kiryat Yarim, all of you guys know that because you say that's where David took the ark up, Kiryat Yarim, up to Jerusalem. And so this is where David brought the ark up. Remember when the guy touched the ark and was killed by the Lord, Uzzah, Peretz Uzzah? And so this is the Kiryat Yarim entrance. Now, where's Samson? Shimshon, or Sonny, lives right here in this area of Zoan and Beit Shemesh. Beit Shemesh, house of the sun. This is where uh, Samson's from. Okay? Now, where's Samson's first wife from? When he goes to get married, his wife is from Timnah. Do you see how close that is? So he goes out, basically Samson hangs out. This is where Samson hangs out. This is where she hangs out. They're neighboring towns. And so Samson meets this Philistine woman, and that's when he goes down and does, does the stuff with, with her. Okay? Um, okay, now one other entrance that's important later on for us is the Ella Valley. This Ella Valley, by the way, do you see the town Gath here? Who's famous from Gath? He was a big guy, didn't like kids throwing stones at him. Goliath of Gath, okay? When Goliath of Gath comes and fights Israel, they fight in this Ella Valley. The Ella Valley goes right up to what town? Bethlehem. David's from Bethlehem. David comes down from Bethlehem here. And this is where David fights Goliath right here. This is how you enter. This is how, if you want to get up in the mountains, that's how you do it. And this is where they fought. Goliath was from Gath. David was from Bethlehem. And they fight in the Valley of Ella. So Samson, Shimshon, he's going to hang out right here. And he's going to meet this girl from Timnah. And uh, just some geography on that. Now, chapter 13, here's what happens with Samson. The, again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. So you've got this uh, rebellion and then retribution. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. So the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. Did the Philistines like to beat up on Jews? Yes, they did. The Philistines were iron, worked with iron and stuff. They had uh, the technology on their side. And they uh, would go after the Jews. And what happens is there's... Uh, there's a, a, a woman named, uh, a man named Manoah. He's got a wife, 
And an angel comes to Manoah's wife and says, basically, you're going to have a son. And when you have a son, he's from his birth. He's not, he's not to take anything of the grape. He's not to cut his hair. In other words, from birth, he's going to be a what? He's a Nazarite from birth. Never cuts his hair for his whole lifetime. By the way, she is even told, she is even told, don't drink any wine. You've got a baby in your belly. Uh, who's going to be a Nazarite, and you as his mother are not to drink any wine, okay? Which just means in prenatal care you shouldn't do drugs, right? Before, you know. Okay, no, no, that was, that was a joke. Well, not really a joke, but you know what I'm saying, okay? Does this passage prove that? No. Is she not to drink wine because it's alcohol, or is she not to drink wine because he's a Nazarite? It's because he's a Nazarite. It's nothing, you know, anyway, so let me get out of that. But anyway, sorry. So Samson is born, Samson grows up, and then Samson goes down to Timnah, and he finds there a woman that he wants to marry. In verse chapter 14, Samson went down to Timnah and saw a young Philistine woman, and he returned and said to his father and mother, I have seen a Philistine woman in Timnah, now get her for me for my wife. He sees the girl, but questioned, did the in the ancient times, did the parents, were they arranged marriages? Did the parents have to arrange the marriage? I think this is a good thing. Anyways, the parents, actually, it's crazy. Uh, but anyways, the, that's the way they did it back then. I shouldn't say it's crazy. By the way, do some cultures do that till this day, where the parents arrange the marriage? So he goes to his parents and he says, give this girl for me that I've seen. I've often said, um, what is love? What is love? Geography plus hormones equals love, okay? You can write that down. Geography plus hormones equals love. Why did Samson fall in love with this girl? Was she located in Timna, the next town over? In other words, the geography, the, the geography, who do you fall in love with? Do you fall in love with the people you're around, the people you work with, the people you go to school with? You know, the, the, does geography have a big deal, part to do with it? Geography has a big part to do with it. So Samson, right next door to Timnah, falls and get this girl for me and things. His parents then come back. His father and mother replied, isn't there an acceptable woman among your relatives, among all our people? Must you go after the uncircumcised Philistines to get a wife? But Samson said to his father, get her for me. She is the right one for me. Okay. And it's interesting, the parents here and this is a point that I want to bring up as far as his wife from Timnah. The parents seem to have an inability to say no to Samson. Samson gets what Samson wants. Samson wants this girl. They object to it, and he overrides their objection, and he gets this girl from Timnah, the Philistine from Timnah. Now, the Lord was also involved in this. The Lord was involved in this and was going to use Samson's attraction to this woman to defeat the Philistines of sorts. So... Samson goes down the first time, and what does he do? He meets by a lion. Samson, very, very strong guy, rips the lion apart with bare hands kind of thing, takes the lion apart, kills the lion, and then he goes down to see his, his, his future wife and things. He comes back a second time, and when he comes back to the carcass of the lion, what's in the carcass of the lion? There's some bees and some honey. And so what he does is he grabs, I always wonder how you do that without all the fear of finalia. But anyways, he gets the... He, well, he smokes them out or whatever, he, but he gets, the, he gets the honey, and so now he's got what? Now, by the way, it tells you the story about this lion and the honey, because is that going to become important later on? Yeah, so then he goes down there. He's this big, strong guy. He's going to do some incredible feats. He is really tremendously strong, obviously endowed by the Spirit of God, but also really just strong guy and things. Have you ever seen a strong, big, strong guy, the athletic type, want to also be the smart guy? And so Samson here has got to prove he's the smart guy. And so he's going to tell them this riddle. So he goes down to, to the wedding, and they're in this wedding feast, seven-day wedding feast and things. And Samson says, uh, let me tell you a riddle, Samson says to them. If you can give me an answer within seven days of the feast, I will give you 30 linen garments and 30 sets of clothes. And if, I, if you can't tell me the answer, then you must give me 30 uh, linen garments and 30 sets of clothes. Tell us the riddle, they said. Let's hear it. He replied, and this is the famous riddle. There's, there are the riddles in the Bible, too. They're riddles. Out of the eater came something to eat. Out of the eater came something to eat. Out of the strong came something sweet. Out of the strong came something sweet. 
So then what happens? They can't solve the riddle, and on the fourth day, they said to Samson's wife, if you can't get it from facing up the man one-to-one, -one, what do you do? Go through the wife, right? Question, is that effective? Yes, it is. Okay, I don't recommend it, but it is effective. Okay, been there, done that kind of thing, if you know what I mean. So, okay, on the fourth day, they said, coax your husband into explaining us the riddle, or we will burn you and your father's household to death. Did you invite us here to rob us? Then Samson's wife threw herself on him, sobbing. You hate me. You hate me. You don't really love me. You've given my people a riddle, and you haven't told me the answer. You're on your wedding, right? And this is like a seven-day feast of your wedding, and your wife starts bawling. What do you do, okay? Now, I just, I always feel like when I go to those passages, I better, should bring this up. I know a young man um, who, when he got married, um, they went through the wedding. By the way, is there a lot of pressure on the woman when you're going to a wedding thing? Is there a huge amount of pressure? Yes, and it, it, our wedding's now worse than it's ever been, as far as, in my opinion, as far as the pressure goes. So this woman was very, very pressurized and stuff. They went through the wedding ceremony. Everything went, seemed to go well. They went down in the basement of the church and had a reception there. And they, you know, eat dinner with everybody and go around greeting everybody. And everything's cool and stuff like that. Then after it's all over, then they get in the car with the cans and they ride off into the sunset and they go on their honeymoon night. And the guy is there, oh, finally at last, I'm married to this woman. Like, this is the best day of my life. And the guy's so happy and stuff. They get to the hotel and all of a sudden, she starts crying. And the guy is trying to figure out, what did I do? What did I do? You know, did I say something wrong? Was there something I shouldn't do? What do you want? Do you want flowers? Do you want, what, what do you want? I mean, whatever you want, I'll get it to you. Why are you crying like this? I don't know why I'm crying. Do you, do you ever ask a woman why they cry? It's like, I don't, if they don't know why they're crying, how are you supposed to figure that out? I'll tell you, I don't know. So anyways, you go, what is it? What is wrong? What's wrong? Did I say the vowels right? I said the vowels right and stuff. What's wrong? You go, I'm okay, what's the deal here, you know? And so I'm serious, and you're freaking out because you've never been married before, and all of a sudden she starts crying, okay? And all I want to tell you is, have you ever been in a situation where the adrenaline is really strong and there's so much pressure and adrenaline, 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 and then all of a sudden you get to relax, and when you come down, all of a sudden you start crying for no reason? And that's what can happen, well, that is what happened in certain weddings I'm very familiar with, okay? And a woman starts crying and stuff. And it wasn't that he did anything wrong. I don't think he did. Um, but uh, it was because she was just, you know what I'm saying? The wedding thing, well, pressure, it was all over now, and she just, and it just took her down. And so all I'm saying is this, it's not cool. When, when a wife cries at a wedding, well, it's not a good thing, okay? But it, but it happens because of these cycles, and I'm just wanting to warn you because nobody warned me, and it was and I didn't work too well. So, all right. Why is Samson stupid? His wife threw herself on him, sobbing, you hate me, you hate me, you don't really love me, you've given a riddle to my people, but you haven't told me the answer. Now, Samson is going to say some things here. Tears, are tears powerful? Is Samson strong? A woman cries, the strong man what? What do you do? when a woman, you, it's, it's like you're helpless. You're helpless. Big, strong Samson is helpless. To a woman's tears, what can you do? It's, and so the tears, but then what happens is, and what I'm going to suggest is how not to treat a woman. He says this. This is Samson's response. She's crying. He says, you haven't told me the answer. Me, your loved wife, you haven't told me the answer. He says, I haven't even explained it to my father and mother, he said. Why should I explain it to you? Um, rule number one, you don't bring the father-in-law and mother-in-law into it. You bring the father and mother-in-law into it, it explodes. It's ugly. You never do that. That is really stupid. Now you say, Hildebrand, how do you know that? I know that's stupid. Been there, done that, okay? I'm just telling you this is the voice of experience. You don't bring the father and mother-in-law in, and you don't bring her father and mother-in-law in. You deal with it without those external things. And so this, what Samson did here, is really stupid. You don't say, I haven't even told my father and mother, so why should I tell you? It's like, what, what does that do to her status? He has just placed her over or under his father and mother. Under, and he's supposed to be married to this woman. She's supposed to... Okay, this, this is really stupid. 
And so then she cried the whole seven days of the feast. So on the seventh day, he finally told her because she continued to press him. She, in turn, explained the riddle to her people. Before sunset, the seventh day, they come in and say, Ah, what is sweeter than honey and what is stronger than a lion? And they got his riddle. And then this, this guy just doesn't get it. This is really funny. I mean, it's really terrible. Don't ever do this. He says then, they, they got his riddle. What is sweeter than honey? What is stronger than a lion? Samson said, if you had not plowed with my heifer, you would not have solved my riddle. Um, this is called speaking metaphorically. And when you speak metaphorically and you use a heifer to metaphorically symbolize your wife. Now, by the way, are there certain animals that the Bible uses to symbolize a woman like a gazelle or beauty? You know what I'm saying? They're beautiful animals. Uh, no, no, in the Song of Solomon, you, okay. A heifer is a heifer. No, you don't use a heifer, okay? That's like terrible. So Samson here just really... I mean, that's, uh, it's over. So what happens is, the Spirit of the Lord came on him in power. He goes down and kills 30 Philistines, brings back their garments, gives them the guy. And then what does he do to his wife, by the way? And burning with anger, he went to his father's house, and Samson's wife was given to his friend. Now, this is something you got to know, that in those kind of contexts, you had a rea, you had a friend who was like your best man, actually, what we would call, and it's not, don't, you can't make it go like between cultures like that. But basically, if the guy bails out, then the, the best man marries the woman, okay? And so that's, uh, anyway, so what Samson says is, so he's kind of like in this marriage process, it falls apart, and so the, the other guy steps in and so Samson goes back home. This is a disaster. Yeah, Hannah? Yeah, yeah. How often did guys bail out and why? <laughs> I don't know. Samson bailed up because he was angry because his wife betrayed him and that not didn't tell him those guys. But if she hadn't betrayed him, what would they have done to her father? They would have killed her, his, her father. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, they had uh, backups even back then. And, uh, but, but the reasons are often complicated. So this is how Samson gets started. This is his first wife, his wife at Timna. Three strikes and you're out. This is his first strike, okay? The relation, the Spirit of God on people on the Old Testament. It says the Spirit of God came on Samson and he went out and, and slew the 30 Philistines and stuff. So the Spirit of God is his strength and things. Uh, what was the relationship of the Spirit of God and people in the Old Testament? Did the Spirit of God ever leave people in the Old Testament? Can you tell me of another person where the Spirit of God left him? Saul, King Saul. Now, some people think when the Spirit of God left him, that means Saul is not a believer in God anymore, that he lost his salvation and things. No, no, no. The Spirit of God endowed them with special gifts. Samson was endowed with the gift of strength. Saul was endowed with the gift of kingship. When the Spirit leaves him, that means that the Spirit of kingship leaves Saul. It doesn't mean he's necessarily an unbeliever. There, Saul had other problems that make that clear, but it wasn't the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God is in a different way. But some people think that the Spirit of God only came in Acts chapter 2. In the New Testament at Pentecost, the Spirit comes down at Pentecost. Was there the Spirit of God in the Old Testament? Yes, it did. And it came on people, endowing these people with certain gifts. The gift in Samson's case was strength, with Saul for kingship. And so you're going to see the Spirit of God working with people in the Old Testament. It wasn't that the Spirit of God wasn't here. It's in Acts chapter 2. Oh, I'll leave that for your New Testament prof. Um, so anyway, so this is the Spirit of God was in the Old Testament, came on and endowed people with gifts. Now that's Samson's first woman. Who's the second woman? Samson goes down to Gaza. I call this woman the Gaza Stripper. Okay? No, it's, no, 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 you, no, it's the Gaza Strip. You realize the strip of land there? So anyways, it works out well. Um, but, and, um, but anyways, sorry. Um, so this is Gaza. He goes down to Gaza. Samson went down to Gaza where he saw a prostitute. He went in to spend the night with her. Okay? Now, by the way, I told you how much respect I have for Dr. Gordon Hugenberger. Okay, uh, top thinker and just quality, one of the best preachers I've ever heard in my life. Dr. Hugenberger goes over to Hebrews 11, and in Hebrews 11, it says one of the great heroes of the faith is Samson. Samson, in Hebrews 11, is listed among the great heroes of the faith. And so he comes back and he says, he doesn't see this stuff as being negative, Samson going into a prostitute. And what he does, and I, I thought, how does he do this? 
and he stopped his he stopped his like his sermon series on judges before he did Samson. And I just was I was on the edge of my seat waiting for a solution, but I found out here's what he does. He says, "Who also in Israel went into a prostitute, a Jewish person going into a prostitute that was okay, it was totally kosher." I mean, well, however you want to say it. Okay. Yeah, does everybody remember Joshua sent out the spies and the spies went into whom? Rahab the harlot. Now, were they there for her business and stuff or they were trying to get information, right? So it was a spying endeavor. So what Dr. Hugenberger does apparently, and I've not heard him say this, I heard it through the grapevine, is that Samson's going to this woman's house maybe in a spying kind of context and things. Um, I think he was spying, but it was on something different than the land, okay? You know, if you know what I mean. So anyways, I, so I would take this as Samson doing his thing with women again, and so I would take this in a negative context. But what I want, what I want to use this passage for is this woman at Gaza, this prostitute at Gaza, the Philistines surround him and they say, in the morning we're going to kill Samson. In the morning we're going to kill Samson. And so Samson wakes up in the middle of the night and he pulls the door frame out of the wall and walks with this. And now this is what's really important to me. Uh, in terms of strength of Samson. First of all, if you pull this door frame out of here, would this be a big thing to carry, this door frame? Um, this door frame's made out of metal, and to be honest with you, it's cheap metal, or sheet, sheet metal kind of thing, and it, it would be about 30, 40 pounds. That's not too much. You could carry 30, 40 pounds for a long way, right? When you pulled out the door posts in the ancient world, they weren't made out of cheap metal. They're made out of posts, okay? Are we talking hundreds of pounds? Yes, hundreds of pounds. Samson hauls them. The other thing is, you need, um, have you guys ever done, has anybody ever put up hay in here? When I was down in Tennessee, we put up hay. So I was a young guy, about 25, and so these guys get these uh, 100, 200 bales of hay, and they said, well, you get in a truck and you throw them up to us in the loft. And the, so, I, so I get in there and say, oh, these bales of hay are 30, 40 pounds. I'm throwing them up there, man. So I'm throwing these bales of hay up there. This is nothing, man, because they think I'm a city slicker, and they're the country folk, you know, they're the, they're the farmers, strong ones and stuff. So I'm throwing those bales of hay up there, and I throw, you know, 20 bales of hay up there, and then I throw 30 bales of hay up there, and then I throw 40 and 50, and by the time they were done with me, I was pushing the bales up with my shoulder. I couldn't lift my arms anymore because it was just, you know what I'm saying? Samson carries these things about 20 miles, and it's all uphill. And he sets them up in front of Hebron. We know where that, these places are. It's about 20 miles, and it's uphill. Question, when you carry weights uphill, is uphill a problem? Yeah, and 20 miles, is that a good distance to carry this kind of stuff? Is this guy a hulk? This guy, this guy is a massive individual, normal human being. Uh, you'd be lucky to walk the 20 miles uphill like that. He's carrying this couple hundred pounds type thing, at least, up this way. So Samson, incredibly strong. By the way, he's, um, you know, the Spirit of God comes on him in power, and he's just extremely uh, endowed in this stuff. So this is, he hauls the walls there, or the doorway, actually, the posts and stuff. Now... Next woman, and this is the final woman in his life, is Delilah. And Delilah is very famous even to this day. She's got a radio program and everything now and stuff. But it says that sometime later, he, Samson, fell in love, this is chapter 16, verse 4, fell in love with a woman of the Sorek Valley whose name was Delilah. Okay? Notice it says he fell in love with her. Uh, what's the problem with that? Have many of you guys been trained in kind of Greek thinking? You've got agape and you've got eros, right? And agape and eros love are very, very different, right? Agape love is very what spiritual and, and self-sacrificial love. And, and eros love is erotic love, very sensual, lustful. So erotic love is lustful. Agape love is this kind of spiritual. And in Greek, we really make this separation between agape and eros. In Hebrew, they don't have that distinction. In Hebrew, they don't have that distinction. The word for love is, is the word achav, and it includes uh, both uh, love and lust. Okay, It includes both love and lust at times. And so this brings us the question up, is it always so easy to separate between love and lust? When I was younger, they tried to portray lust over here and uh, you know real love over here. And what I'm saying is, when you actually fall in love sometimes, does the love and lust get all entangled? And so be careful about this Greek way of thinking. The Hebrew thinking is much more organic and stuff. And, and so anyways, Samson falls in love with her and, and basically, okay. 
Now, she nags him, and basically the Philistines show up to Delilah, and they say, Delilah, you want to make some money? And Delilah says, oh, yeah. And so she said, they said, tell us the secret of his strength, and we'll take Samson down. They're going to pay her some silver. Notice, what is she doing? Delilah is selling Samson. Notice here is that the woman selling the man for money. Oftentimes is that reversed, but in this case, is it Delilah selling Samson? So Samson, she comes to Samson and she nags him. Delilah said to Samson, tell me the secret of your great strength and how you can be tied up and subdued. Samson answered, if anybody ties me with seven fresh thongs that, may not, uh, that have not been dried, I will be as weak as any other man. Guess what? He wakes up and he's got seven thongs tying him and stuff. Samson, the Philistines are on you. What's he do? Snaps the things, he jumps up. Now, whenever, did you get, when you guys read this, did you realize how stupid Samson was? It was like, she does this over and over and over again. And it's like, how can anybody be that dumb? I want to explain, I don't, I don't think that's the point here. Is this narrative compressed? Is it possible that these different trials with the seven, you know, thrust thongs, going to the seven ropes, then going to tie, braiding his hair and stuff, is it possible that this was over months and months of time that this narrative was spread out? By the way, when you write history, does, do people ever take narrative and compress it? And so what happens is it makes it seem like all these events were one after another after another, close related. It could have been that they were separated by quite a bit of time. And so Samson, what I'm trying to say, Samson's not as dumb as what he looks, okay? And so this may have been spread out over time and things. But finally she gets down, he starts playing with the hair, braiding the hair in and things like that. And nagging does seem to work. And what I'm suggesting is Samson here, the time compression thing. It's how history is written. By the way, do historians ever take events that are maybe 50 years apart and put them back to back in history? Just because that's the way they're writing history and they don't want to go through all the details. And so history, this history always involves some sort of compression. Uh, if you take history at Gordon College here, you'll find some wonderful historians that talk about historiography, how history is written. And a lot of times events that are distant from each other are put back to back because you collapse history, you compress history. If you wrote a totally exhaustive history, it'd be too much for anybody to read. And so basically every, all history is compressed. Now, what's interesting then, Samson um, cut his hair, so Delilah cuts his hair and she tells the Philistines, I think I got it this time, this is it. So she shaves his head, cuts his hair, and um, Samson then is, is captured by the Philistines. The Philistines, what is the first thing they do to him when they capture him? You got a guy that's really strong, you want to use his strength, but you want to incapacitate him, what do you do? You blind him, okay? So they blind him. They poke out, gouge out his eyes. And now he's strong, but you know what I'm saying? A little child could attack him because he can't see where it's coming from. And so therefore, he's, he's now a blind, very strong guy. By the way, they, they take him out then. It says, when the people saw him, they praised their God, saying, our God has delivered our enemy into our hands. But is God going to use Samson, even in a blinded state, to accomplish his purposes? And so what happens is the people pull Samson out and they make him do tricks. And it's like a circus. And you got this big strong guy who's going to do all these tricks. And Samson does these tricks. But then Samson says to his, the boy that's with him, that's guiding him and stuff, he basically says, um, well, he, first he prays to God. Then Samson prayed to the Lord, O oh, sovereign Lord, remember me, O oh God. Please strengthen me just once more and let me with one blow get revenge on the Philistines for my two eyes. Is Samson pretty vengeful here? He wants vengeance for his two eyes. Would you have liked him to said, I want to be, I want to, you know, for your name, God, I want to, you know, to show you the victory. But he's worried about his two eyes. Then Samson reached toward the two central pillars. He's going to take the two central pillars. He's going to collapse the pillars. The whole building's going to fall down. There's about 3,000 people. Samson kills more in his death than he killed in his life. Now, what's interesting here is we've got two pillars in this room. If you knock down these two pillars, would this whole building collapse? I don't think so. I think there's enough you know, cross beams and stuff like that that would possibly hold this. Do you know that they have found on the Philistine plain, out in the Philistine plain, they have found some Philistine temples. Our different cultures produce different styles of temple. 
Yeah, Israel's temple, by the way, the one Solomon, you guys have read about Solomon building the temple? Solomon's temple was built on a Phoenician model from up in Lebanon. Why? Because Hiram, he hired from Phoenicia, built it. And so when you look at the Israelite temple that, is, that Solomon built, it's very similar to the ones built up in Phoenicia. Almost the, 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 the plan, the, what do you call it, the plan uh, that you use for building? The blueprint, the blueprint is exactly the same as what you get up in Phoenicia. The Philistine temples, they found, have two pillars in the middle of them with load-bearing wall, okay? In other words, all the weight comes to those two pillars. You take those two pillars down, and these Philistine temples, what happens? The whole place collapses. So by the way, as archaeology shown that this actually works. You take out that the whole building is weighted on these two pillars, and so actually it's been really interesting confirmation. The Bible says Solomon, Samson takes down the two pillars and the place collapses. Samson dies, and uh, this is the life of Samson. Now Samson is listed. How can Samson be listed as a great hero of the faith? Given all this kind of messed up life, to be honest with you, it's a lot of stuff. How can Samson? I think what the Bible is showing us is some of the great heroes of the faith, did they have messed up lives? Did some of the great heroes of the faith have messed up lives? Okay? And that gives me hope. That gives me hope because I got a messed up life, okay? Hopefully not that bad. I mean, you know, doing stuff like that. But it just, you know what I'm saying? Have you seen, have, almost everybody in the Old Testament we've seen, has every one of them had problems of one sort or another? David is the man after God's own heart. Well, you know about David now, right? And so, yeah, you got problems with all these people. And so I think what the Bible is saying is that believers in God are not better than everybody else. They've got problems just like everybody else, but they believe in God and God uses them to accomplish his purposes. And it's wonderful to be able to be a servant of God, even though you've got, there's, there's stuff going down. So Samson's a hero, but he's not perfect. He's got his problems and such is life. Now, the tale of two cities, tale of two, I mean, two Levites, uh, the tale of two Levites. The book of Judges ends with these, what I call this tale of two Levites. And there's one Levite. Um, well, first of all, let me start the story. This is the first Levite, the Danite Levite. And I'm going to do chapters 17 and 18 and Judges chapter 17 and 18. Uh, there's a guy from Ephraim. Where is Ephraim? Ephraim is right above Benjamin, right? So it's just Judah, Benjamin, Ephraim. So it's right up in there. And there's a guy in Ephraim, and he's got a lot of silver and gold and stuff, so he makes himself an idol. So he makes himself an idol, and then he says, hey, I got an idol now. But, and then all of a sudden, a Levite is passing through Ephraim, and this guy Micah, this guy Micah says to the, to the Levite, he says, you know, I got this gold, this gold silver uh, idol here. Why don't you come be my priest? Why don't you come be my priest? I got this idol and I will pay, you know, you can live with me. I will pay your shelter. I'll give you food. And basically, I'll take care of you. You be my priest. So the Levite then becomes Micah's priest. Le Micah makes the idol. And then he hires this Levite. He hires this Levite to be his priest. Now, he's got an idol and a priest. This guy has got a pretty good gig going. He's got a little religious corner here and things. Now what happens? Now what happens? The tribe of Dan, what was the problem the tribe of Dan had? The tribe of Dan is out by the Philistine plain, which means that the Philistines were beating up on the Danites all the time because they were, <coughs> excuse me, their tribal territory was right out with the Philistines. So Danites said, we're tired of fighting the Philistines. We're going to go north. We heard that it's really, really nice, and it is one of the most beautiful places in Israel, in the north. So the Danites migrate north. When they migrate north, what tribe do they have to go through? Ephraim. So they go by Micah's house, and they say, hey, this guy Micah's got a, he's got an, a, one of these metal idols, and he's also got a priest, this Levite. So the tribe of Dan, now this is a whole tribe moving, and this whole tribe is going to go from being a tribal territory down to being a city, a particular city, north of Israel, kind of back where Kyle is sitting. Way, Dan is going to be the northernmost point of Israel. The tribe is moving from the Philistine territory all the way up north. And they come by this Levite, and they said, hey, Levite, why don't you come with us? You come with us, you can be a Levite, you can be a priest for a whole tribe. You don't have to be just for some little family, you can be for a whole tribe. So the Levite says, hey, that's a pretty good gig, I'll go with you guys. And so the Levite goes north, 
The Levite then goes up to the city of Dan in the north, and he sets up an idol up there, and this priest then, this Levite, becomes the priest at Dan. Is this, is this, is this idolatry in Israel? And so this is where Dan, Dan is associated with this idolatry. And it even says here, if you, um, in a certain place here, um, yeah, therefore the Danites set up themselves idols, and Jonathan the son of Gershom, the son of Moses actually, and his sons were priests for the tribe of Levite until the time of the captivity of the land. They continued to use idols Micah had made all the time the house of God was at Shiloh. So the tabernacle is going to be at Shiloh, and all the time it's at Shiloh, the Danites are worshiping an idol up in Dan. Now there's going to be one other place that an idol is set up later on. In other words, this narrative is setting you up for later on. Later on, there's a guy named Jeroboam. Do you remember him? And he's going to set up idols at what two places? One's going to be in Dan, coming out of this narrative, I believe. One of them is going to be at Dan, and where's the other one going to be that he's going to set up a golden calf? Does anybody remember the place? Bethel. Yeah, down in Bethel. Why does he set it up at Bethel? Is Bethel a holy place? What happened to Bethel? Is Bethel where Jacob's ladder took place, where Jacob met God at Bethel? And so Jeroboam uses that place and sets up a golden calf and says, this is Yahweh, this is Jehovah, this calf. And God says, no, I'm not a calf, I'm not a golden calf. And God condemns Jeroboam for setting up idols at Dan and Bethel. So Dan was in the north and Bethel was in the south and things. So this narrative, this narrative sets up this problem of Dan that Israel will have later on. Now that's the first, that's our first uh, Dan, uh, Levite, the Danite Levite. Now our second Levite, and this story is in chapter 19, and this story is a rather gross story, the Levite's concubine. The Levite's concubine, chapter 19, and so I just want to kind of put some geography on this. Uh, first of all, do you see here there's a main road running right here. This road is Route 1, okay? Now this road, it's not 95. 95 is the big superhighway. This is kind of, a, it's called the Ridge Route. It's the Ridge Route. It runs on a ridge north and south in Israel. This runs on a Ridge Route, and it's called the Ridge Route. And so basically you come from Bethel, you travel Mitzpah, Gibeah, Jerusalem, Bethlehem, on down to Hebron. This is the ridge route. So what happens is the Levites from up here and his concubine, first of all, when you got a Levite with a concubine, is that a problem? Okay, anyways, Levite's got a concubine and the concubine runs home. So she runs home to Bethlehem. So then the Levite chases her and he runs home and he catches her at Bethlehem at her, at her parents' home. And then it's kind of like uh, Thanksgiving vacation a little bit. Have your parents ever, when you come home, they say, can't you stay just a day or two more? Do your parents ever do that? Can't you stay just a little bit longer? Can't you stay just a little bit longer? Can't you stay just a little bit longer? And so what happens is the, Le the Levite stays with his concubine's house for a little bit longer. Finally, he says, we got to get out of here. I got to get going. And so basically, they leave late in the afternoon. They come up here. It's about five miles here. They walk up past Jerusalem. When they get to Jerusalem, the, the lady's tired. And she says, man, I'm just tired of walking stuff. Why don't we, why don't we go here to Jebus and things? And the guy says, no, I don't want to go into the Jebus, because Jebus is what? The Jebusites? The Jebusites live here? They're not Jewish. So he says, I want to go up to Jewish territory, so basically, I'm going to go up to Gibeah. Okay? And then from Bethlehem. So there, he comes up, passes by Jerusalem, won't go in there because these people are not Jewish. He comes up to Gibeah, and he says, I want to be with the Jewish people there at Gibeah. Now, what happens when he pulls into Gibeah? This is where it gets nasty. Okay, uh, the storyline basically goes like this. He pulls into town. It's almost a Sodom and Gomorrah situation. He pulls into town, and he's out, he's out in the neighborhood, in the, in the common square, and basically an old guy comes up to him and says, you shouldn't be here. Come home with me. And he invites the concubine, his, uh, the Levite and his concubine, home with him. He says, you shouldn't be out here. Uh, once upon a time, I was traveling in uh, Los Angeles, the city of Los Angeles. I'd never been there before. We drove all the way out to California, 
And so I, I said, I want to go down to Los Angeles. I want to see the beaches in Los Angeles and things. And so my friend said, I don't want to go down to Los Angeles. And he was supposed to be taking us around. I said, we're going down to Los Angeles. And so he says, OK, we'll go down to Venice, this place called Venice Beach. So we get down to Venice Beach, and we look around there with my kids and stuff. We get back in this uh, van that we had, and we're, we're trying to get up on the throughways. These throughways are going over our head, but we can't get up to the throughways. So we're driving around all these neighborhoods in LA. We have no idea where we are. We pull up. There's a guy who's about 6'5", big dude. We pull up, and I roll down my window, and I says, man, can you tell us how to get on, uh, get on the throughway here? The first thing the guy said to me, did not even answer my question. The first thing he said to me, he says, you shouldn't be here. You shouldn't be here. Uh, question. When a guy like that says you shouldn't be here, question. Should we not be here? He said, yes, sir. We'll try to get out of here as soon as we can. How do you get to the throughway and stuff? And so he told us how to get there and stuff. But it was really clear we were out of our neighborhood. Okay. And so um, basically what you have here with this uh, guy's telling him, don't stay in the town square. It's going to be bad for you. Come home with me. So they come home with him, and then what happens? The guys show up at the door, and then what happens? They start beating on the door, and it's Sodom and Gomorrah already. Bring the man out to you, to us, that we may, the NIV trans, have sex with him, that we may know him and stuff. Then the guy, almost the same thing, pushed the daughters out. No, no, don't do the daughters. The guy's got his concubine, so he pushes his concubine out. You remember the story, because it's so gross, you can't help but miss it. But anyways, the concubine, the guy's abused the woman all night. She comes the next day, she's where? So he op the next day, he gets up, he opens the door, and there's his concubine laying on the ground. He says, get up, let's go, it's time to go now. And the concubine doesn't move. And then all of a sudden he realizes his concubine's dead. And so then what he does is he puts her on his donkey, takes her back, and then what does he do? It gets worse. He is so ticked off, these guys killed his concubine and stuff, he starts chopping her up. He chops her up into 12 pieces and sends her body parts to the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, by the way, when you're kosher Jewish and stuff and you get this body part, is this like, do the, they freak? Do the tribes freak? It's like, whoa, we've never seen anything like this in Israel before, man. What's going on here? This Gibeah, this town of Gibeah, we're going to go take those people of Gibeah. They need to be punished for what they did. So the tribes, the 12 tribes gather together, they go up against Gibeah, and Gibeah says what? The tribe of Benjamin, which is located with Gibeah, the tribe of Benjamin says, we aren't going to give them up. We aren't going to give them up. So the whole tribe of Benjamin then goes to fight the other 11 tribes of Israel. And so now you have tribal warfare, and what happens? The Israelites go up to attack them, and they lose the first time. They go back to God. God, what's going on? These people are evil. We're trying to do what's right and stuff. God says, go up again. They go up again and they take, they basically, they defeat the uh, tribes of Israel, defeat the Benjamites. But then what's the problem? They kill all the Benjamites, and so 600 of the guys get away. 600 of them get away. And they go up on this uh, defensible high territory that they can't get to them. So 600 of Benjamites. But what's the problem? They want to go up and kill the 600 Benjamites, but what's the problem? If you kill those 600 Benjamites, what has just happened to one of the tribes of Israel? It's like the black rhinoceros. They become extinct. And there are no more of the Benjamite tribe. And so they realize, they realize, hey, man, we've got to call this time out. There's only 600 of these guys left. Uh, we've got to reconstitute the tribe. We're going to lose one of our tribes of Israel. But then what's the problem? How are these guys going to reproduce? They've got to marry somebody. But all the guys that were in battle swore that they would not give their daughters to be married to a Benjamite. Would you want to give your daughter a guy like that? No. So they said, we will not give our daughters there. So then they said, what are we going to do now? we got these 600 guys. we got to get them to have children and multiply again. They said, oh, Benjamin's located right here. There was a city over here called Jabesh Gilead. And the men of Jabesh Gilead did not come to battle. So what they did was they went to Jabesh Gilead, rounded up 400 girls, and brought those 400 girls over to the Benjamites. And now you've only got 200 left that don't have wives. So now what are we going to do? we got 200 that don't have wives. By the way, don't laugh. I think you don't want, you don't want to do it the way the Bible does, this dating thing. You don't want to date just the way the Bible does it, okay? You know, kiss dating goodbye, do it just like the Bible does, just the way the Bible does it, okay? So they go to Shiloh, and the girls are coming out for a feast, and they're going to be dancing at Shiloh, where the temple, uh, the tabernacle was, and they're going to be dancing. They said, what we'll do is, these 200 guys, put them in the bushes. When the girls come out to dance, the guys come out of the bushes, just catch whichever, whichever one you catch, that one's yours. Now, I always have said, Gordon College, we got a quad. We got, you know, do it like the Bible says, you know? And so anyways, 
So this is, uh, yes, I am joking, okay, to get these, these horrendous looks and stuff, okay. But I'm not, but, but that's what happened. So these other guys now, so now the tribe of Benjamin, now that you say, what, Hildebrand, why do you tell the story? This, start, my, this is what my mother would say. You don't have to tell those stories, then. You know, there, there's, there's these really lurid stories in the Bible. You, don't, you shouldn't be telling college students this kind of stuff. My question is to myself, though, is this. The concubine is raped and killed, divide and conquer. And this is how they get the wives for the Benjamites. They should have been hitting the, hitting the things here. Jabesh Gilead provides things. This Jabesh Gilead, by the way, the reason why I mention that, that's going to become important for us later on. There's a guy named... Well, anyways, I wouldn't say his name, but he was Jabesh Gilead. And then the Shiloh dancers, and that's where they come up with the wives for these Benjamites. Not too bad of a method. Now, why does the Bible include this such stories? And the Bible doesn't tell us why, but I think I've got a suggestion here. The story of the Benjamites, what is the book of Judges setting up? There is no what in Israel. In the time of the judges, there is no king of Israel, and everyone does that which is right in his own eyes. Who is going to be the first king of Israel? Saul. What tribe is Saul from? Benjamin. I believe this story is setting up the reign of King Saul. I believe this story in the book of Judges is put in there to set up the tribe of Benjamin. By the way, when they go to make Saul king, do you remember what Saul says? He says, hey, I'm from the least tribe. Does everybody know why he's from the least tribe? Yeah, okay. So Saul is going to be from the tribe of Benjamin. And so I think this story is put up as a background to King Saul. Now, our next story is one of the most beautiful stories in the Bible. It's the story of Ruth. Ruth. And uh, yeah, Green Vice, Steel Magnolias, these were some movies in the past. Are women friendships different than guy friendships? Are women friendships different than guy friendships? I've watched my wife over like 30, 60 years, and I've watched how my wife makes friends with her friends, and it's how she makes friends and the nature of her friendships different than guys and, and guys' friendships. Yes, very different. And what you have in the book of Ruth is two women, you don't often get to see this in scripture, two women, best friends, who become really close friends. And it's, it's beautiful, it's a beautiful story of friendship. Uh, in the book of Ruth. And so, um, but anyways, here's, a, here's what happens in the book of Ruth. There's a series of tragedies happen in the book. Um, first of all, they're from the town of ben Bethlehem. They're from the town of Bethlehem. And she, Naomi, there's a woman, older woman, Naomi, and her husband, Elimelech, are from Bethlehem. And there's a famine in the land. So when there's a famine in the land, what do you do? You migrate, and so you migrate from a lower elevation to a higher elevation because higher elevations get more water. So they basically come from Bethlehem, which would be over here. They go down across the Jordan River, come up on this side over to Moab. Moab is about 500, 700 feet higher. And so what happens is they get more rain over here. And so therefore they come over to Moab to, to get crops. They then settle in Moab, and then what happens? Uh, basically, she's got two sons, Machlon and Kilion. She's got two sons. When two sons are over in Moab, what kind of women are they going to marry? Geography plus hormones equals? Okay, they're going to marry Moabites. So she, her two sons, Machlon and Kilion, marry Moabite women. One of those women woman is Ruth. Is one of, so Ruth is Naomi's daughter-in-law, and her son marries him. Now, what happens in the narrative, all the men do exactly the same thing. This often happens with men. All the men, what? Die. All the men die. It's usually what guys do. All the men die. Okay? Now, what happens is you've got three women by themselves. Three women in a culture by themselves is that hard? Yes, especially in that culture. By the way, is that true in our culture? Yes. I never forget, I had a friend, a student friend that was down at our house all the time. We kind of adopted her as our daughter. And she was from California, and she was out in Winnow Lake, Indiana. And um, she took her car in. She was like our daughter, and we, she was down at our house all the time and stuff. And so then she took her car in, and her battery went dead. And this uh, guy named Pinky, in uh, where we lived, uh, basically had a gas station, and he replaced her battery. Now, when a battery goes dead, the first question I ask is, is the alternator good, or did the alternator kill the battery? So it's not really the battery's problem, it was the alternator killing the battery. 
So the guy replaces the battery, charges their big bucks for the battery, and about two or three weeks later, guess what? The second ba the battery is dead again, and she goes in, and the guy's trying to charge her now, double for the, for the battery and the alternator, and so she comes back saying, I don't know what to do and stuff. Now question, because she was a woman, did, did Pinky take advantage of her? Yes, she did. And so I, I was furious, and so I got in my car. I, I have only done this one time in my life. I drove, and I, I parked my car. He had two garage doors going up for his garage. I parked in front of both of them so no cars could get in or out, and I went in to see Mr. Pinky. And uh, I started proceeding. He had his customers all lined up there sitting there, and I proceeded to tell him that he was ripping off this girl. I did it very gently at first. He got a little bit belligerent, so I raised the tone of my voice, so I was shouting at him about how he was ripping off this young girl. Meanwhile, all his customers are sitting there, okay? Get the point. And so I'm being very vulnerable. And then, then he's saying, I gotta get this car out there. There, there. There's an inspection and stuff like that. I get a car out. I said, sorry, I'm not moving my car until you give her back her money. And uh, I, was, I, wasn't go I, I wasn't going anyways. And so finally, the guy gets, so he's hollering at me and stuff like that. Finally, he goes over to the register, what, picks out her check and throws it back at us. And once we got our money back, guess what? We left. Okay? And so, but, but, but by the way, did, okay, and by the way, I, I say out of poetic justice today, if you go down to Warsaw, Indiana, and, and you look and where Pinky's gas station was, guess what happened to Pinky's gas station? This is no joke. Two years later, there was a bulldozer went there, and they paved it and made Pinky's into a parking lot now. So anyways, I always thought poetic justice there. Anyways, but what I'm trying to say is that you've got Naomi and Ruth and Orpah, Orpah goes back home, but Ruth goes back with Naomi, back to Bethlehem. You got these women by themselves in their culture. Are they very vulnerable in that culture? Very vulnerable in that culture. And so now what you've got is males all die and stuff, but what something you miss in the book of Ruth that's really important, the names of the characters. The names of the characters are important. Check the name of this guy, Elimelech. They used to have a song like that in my day and age. It was called Elimelech, Elimelech, Elimelech. Anyways, it was Elimelech, okay? Eli means what? El, El, God, Eli, my God is Melech. What is Melech? King. My God is king. This is in the period of Judges. Who is king over Israel? Elimelech, my God is king. Is this a good name for the period of Judges? My God is king. Machlon and Kilion, the name of the two kids, Machlon and Kilion mean weakly and sickly. What do weakly and sickly do in the narrative? They die, okay? Do you see how these names fit, like, incredibly? Weakly and sickly die, okay? Now, Naomi, does Naomi, does Naomi play off her own name? Naomi, the mother who lost her husband, she comes back and she says, comes into town, and this is in chapter uh, 1, verse... Uh, Hmm. Oh man, I lost it. Okay, yeah, there, verse 120. Don't call me Naomi. Naomi means pleasantness. Don't call me Naomi or pleasantness. Call me what? Does anybody remember that? Call me Mara. What is Mara? Bitterness. Bitterness. Why call me Mara? Because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. The Lord has brought me back empty. I am bitter. I am bitter. So she says, don't call me pleasantness, Naomi, call me bitter. By the way, just to finish this out, do you know what root means? Root comes from the root that means friendship. Friend, friend or friendship. By the way, what role does Ruth play in the narrative? Friend to Naomi. By the way, Boaz, and he is the hero, one of the heroes, what, what does Boaz mean? Boaz means strength. What role does Boaz play in the narrative? He's the strong one. Who does it? Do you see how the names, do you see why learning Hebrew is really cool? All of a sudden, this thing, you say, wow, look at this. Just, anyways, it's kind of incredible. Now, on friendship, Naomi and Ruth, Ruth makes this really wonderful statement here. But Ruth replied, Naomi is saying, she's the old lady, she's lost her husband, she's lost her two sons. She turns to Naomi, who's her daughter-in-law, and says, hey, go back to your home. You can't come with me. If you come with me, I'm old. I can't, if I had a child today, you wouldn't wait till he grows up and stuff to marry him. So go home. The Lord has dealt bitterly with me and tells her to go home. And this is what Ruth's response is. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you 
or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Is that a beautiful statement? Where you go, I will go. Your people will be my people, your God, my God. Ruth, is Ruth a friend? That friend indeed. And so this is a beautiful thing here. Ruth uh, accepts the God and loyalty. You know, I forgot the one word. There's a word here, there's a Hebrew word here that's really beautiful for this kind of relationship. It's the word chesed. And I haven't talked at all about it very much in this course. It's H-E-S-E-D. H-E-S-E-D. One word, chesed. Chesed, actually. Chesed is translated, I've translated different ways in my lifetime. Um, I used to translate it as stubborn love. It's not just love, but it's a love that won't quit. It's a love that won't quit. It's a stubborn love that just pursues. Uh, now in the DASV, I translated it loyal love. In other words, it's a loyal, a love that sticks is loyal. Ruth is loyal to Naomi. It's, and she, she exhibits this chesed kind of love, this loyal love. And so this is a great example of chesed. By the way, who has the great chesed of all times? God has loyal love to his people and stuff. So that word chesed is used. Now what happens here is, basically Bethlehem is down here. And I'm just trying to get a little geography on it. Moab is up there. So they migrate from Bethlehem over there, Elimelech, Machlon, and Kilian, and Naomi. They marry, all the guys die. Ruth and Naomi come back to Bethlehem. Now, let's kind of finish up this story. Do circumstances affect one's view of God? Do circumstances affect one's views of God? When I was younger, I was told circumstances shouldn't affect your theology. However, look at this. Call me Mara because the Almighty has made my life bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Do circumstances affect the way people look at God? My son just got back from Afghanistan. He was shot at almost every day that he was over there. Question, did that affect how he views God? Has he had to really wrestle with how he thinks about God when he's seen people blown up right in front? Okay, yeah, it affects how you view God. Your circumstances affect how you view God. And I'm thinking, deal with it. Okay, you got to deal with it, okay? God is the same God, but, but do be aware of that. Now, Ruth goes out, she's a gleaning machine. What's gleaning? Gleaning means she goes out. Remember the guys go out and they sickle? They take a sickle and they knock the stocks down. When they sickle the grain, what happens? Some of the grain falls on the ground. What do the poor people do? The poor people follow behind picking up the, the, the grain that the reapers drop. Basically, the reapers drop grain accidentally and the, the poor people go to get pick up. That's what's called gleaning. What happens? Ruth goes out gleaning then. She's with the poor people trying to glean food. Does Boaz notice her? Boaz notes her, and he says, everybody knows that you are a virtuous woman, a VW. Where have you ever heard the virtuous woman before? Proverbs chapter 31. He calls her a Proverbs chapter 31 woman, and he says, she, and the guys tell Boaz that she's been out there working all day and things like that. She comes home then, she's got all the stuff. Boaz, does Boaz take care of her? Boaz says, you don't go into anybody else's field. You stick with my field. Is Boaz trying to protect her? Don't go to somebody else's field. Stay in my field. Does he tell his guys, drop some extra grain for her? He tells his guys, drop some grain for her. She goes home, she's got all this grain. Naomi says, hey, whose field were you in? She says, Boaz's. And all of a sudden, Naomi, matchmaker, matchmaker, she says, Boaz, Boaz is related to us, you know? And so she tells, basically, she coaches, um, she, Boaz, Basically, she coaches Ruth and says, he's going to be up on the threshing floor tonight. When you go up there, uncover his feet and lay down next to him, and he will tell you what to do. Now, by the way, when she goes up and uncovers her feet, uh, his feet, remember what I told you about feet in Hebrew? Feet can mean something else, and it probably, in this context, does it mean that, that he, she uncovered his feet, probably means something else. Is she offering herself to Boaz? She offers herself to Boaz. Is Boaz going to tell her no? Now, by the way, anybody else in the period of Judges, a woman offers herself to the guy, you know, okay, it's over. Okay, Boaz says he can't. Why? Because there's a kinsman redeemer closer than he is, and he's going to tell her no. Now, she has offered herself. Is she going to feel hurt that she's been rejected? She has just offered herself, her whole self to him, and he's going to say no. Is she going to be hurt? And so Boaz tells her, 
don't be hurt. You are a virtuous woman. Everybody knows that. And he tells her, he says, I've got to check with this guy that's closer, the kinsman redeemer than I. And if he says no, I will marry you. And so he, he tells her no, but does he honor her? Does he, I don't want to call it flattery, does he compliment her? Does he compliment her? And does he spare her dignity? Does he tell her to go home before the lights come on so that no one will know she's there? And she, he, protects, he protects her reputation and he gives her stuff to go home with and stuff. This is called the leveret marriage. When you've got to marry someone, you know what I'm saying? We've seen this before. Someone dies in the family, you marry into the family and you raise up kids to the, the person that died. This is called the leveret marriage, where you have to marry the person uh, and then raise up children for the person that was dead. Now you say, wait a minute, Hildebrand. Why is the story of Ruth in here? In chapter 4, Ruth is the great-grandmother of guess who? David. Okay, Ruth is the great-grandmother of David. In the last chapter of Ruth, you've got a genealogy going from Boaz down to David. Which means then that what? The story of Ruth points forward to whom? To David. The book of Judges, last chapters with the Levite, points forward to Saul. Do you see how these two stories set up the first two kings of Israel in a kind of a really neat way? So the story of, of, of Boaz. Boaz is what? Strength. Does Boaz protect her? Does Boaz protect her? And that is a really important role, uh, protector role. Boaz fulfills that. And we are done. So, see ya, some of you guys after Thanksgiving and some before. This is Dr. Ted Hildebrandt in his Old Testament History, Literature, and Theology course, lecture number 21, finishing up the book of Judges with Samson, and the tale of the two Levites, and then the book of Ruth.